Eternity is waiting. Heaven is waiting. And that's the place where we all want to go where there's no problem and issues. And I hope I hope you've already made plans to go there. I hope you're already ready. In fact, uh, tonight or this morning's message really isn't a salvation thing, but maybe I just need to take a moment here and just say if, if you're watching online or you're here in person and if you don't already have plans to see Jesus, if you haven't prepared your heart and your life, if you're not saved and ready to go at this moment, I just pray that you make that, you take that moment and you make sure you're ready right now. And uh, you, you don't need to wait till an altar call. You, you just pray a simple prayer asking for forgiveness and salvation based on what Jesus did on the cross and the resurrection. Because that song says every knee will bow down. But you can have access to amazing love. Jesus died for you. And because of the cross and the resurrection, you can have eternal life. It's not about what you have done. It's about what Jesus did for you on your behalf, dying for the sins of the world. No one else can wash our sin away, only but the blood of Jesus. And so you can make a decision right now in this moment. Um, I just want to give you some space in order to do that. Because, I mean, there's really nothing more important than knowing that your eternity is is settled. And that you don't have to worry about that. Whatever difficulties you experience now, um, they're only temporary. But heaven is forever. So I just want to give you just a few moments uh, right now to do that. Okay. Hey, um, this morning... I usually, uh, every year I do a sermon series, or I try to do a sermon series on a Bible character, because as we read the stories of Bible characters and we look into their lives, obviously there's so many lessons that they teach us. I mean, think about it, out of all the people in human history that could be in Scripture, God chose a select few, really, honestly, when you think about the millions and millions of people who have gone before God selected uh, a select few to be in his word as examples and inspiration. And these people weren't super duper people. In fact, the Bible is very good, really good about showing all of their faults and failures. In fact, maybe too much. You know, if people like Peter would be here today uh, and could speak to us, uh, you know, he, he sees the whole purpose of things now that he's in heaven, in, in a sense. But, but maybe he would say, you know, I wish they wouldn't have included that about my life. I mean, uh, think about Thomas, for instance, you know. I mean, we, we call him Doubting Thomas because of that famous story where he, he didn't really necessarily trust that Jesus had risen from the grave. And he wanted proof, like any of us wanted proof. And, you know, Thomas, if he could come back, he'd probably be like, man... You know, really doubting Thomas, really? I mean, my whole life, you know, I lived a good life and then I followed Jesus. And you're telling me you wouldn't want evidence either? I'd be like, Thomas, I probably wanted evidence too. Okay, you know, I, I would have thought that the resurrection was fake news. Uh, but then when he touched the scars, hello, when he when he saw Jesus uh, resurrected, it's like, okay, all right, we're going to believe. So these characters in Scripture, they're not perfect. They're just like you and me. Okay, but God does amazing things through them. And they should inspire us and encourage us that God can do amazing things through us. And what's fascinating is that it doesn't really matter in, in these stories where these people come from. Sometimes God uses people of noble birth. Sometimes he uses well-educated people. Sometimes he uses people that we would otherwise not know nothing about were it not be because of what Jesus did through them. Sometimes he changes their lives so radically and powerfully that we know about them. But really, whatever your background is, whatever you've gone through, God can use you. God can change your life, your heart, and your purpose. He can write a legacy through you that it goes beyond you and affects the people that are beside you and who come in the further generations. But this morning, I want to pick a woman. Hello. I did uh, some series on men, and that's all great, but there's some... There's some awesome women in Scripture that God uses. So uh, if you're a lady here this morning, I want you to listen up because, hey, we got some ladies in the Bible that did some amazing things for God. Uh, this is not really going to be a series this morning, Lord willing, but I do want to preach a sermon at least on the woman named Esther in Scripture. Um, the, the, the book that bears her name really talks about a specific moment in life where she does a courageous act on behalf of her people. 
And uh, if you want to follow along with us, you can turn to Esther chapter 4. I'm going to kind of tell most of the story, but we are going to read some scripture at the end of chapter 4 and 5. So Esther is in the Old Testament. If, if you want to just join us there, it's a part of the Jewish uh, history. Esther chapter 4 and chapter 5. But let me kind of just catch you up on this story uh, right as we pray for this sermon. Lord Jesus, please Speak through me. Say what you would want to say in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's this king named King Xerxes. Okay? And he throws a huge party. He is throwing a huge party. In fact, this party goes on for days. Actually, uh, this celebration or this honorarium of who he is goes on for months, actually. He invites a bunch of nobles, uh, the who's who. You know, he rolls out the red carpet. And, and, and I, I would imagine that this is kind of a display of his splendor and his power as a king. You know, I mean, you can imagine he's, he, he's getting all the, the gardens ready, his, his kingdom. He's getting all the wealth. And he's having a, a big, huge celebration. And he, he throws this party and he gets everybody drunk. I mean, you know, this is straight up Old Testament. The Bible doesn't pull any punches. But King Xerxes, he tells the nobility, he says, look, guys, I'm not even going to put a limit on the tab tonight. Everything's on me. Drink as much as you want. We're just going to have a huge time celebrating me and my kingdom. So every, you know, one of these nobilities, you can imagine that the scripture says that his queen uh, Vashti actually goes off and has a separate banquet with some of the women. So this, this party that with all the drinking is probably made up of a lot of men just drinking themselves silly. And of course they do. And, and the scripture says that, you know, King Xerxes gets at this point where he's blind drunk and he, he makes this decree or he, he, he says, all right, uh, eunuchs were some people that were in his, his service. I want you to go get my queen and I want you to bring her out here in front of everybody. <laughs> okay, now if you're the queen, all right, you, you, you are a classy lady. I mean, you're the, you're the queen. Do you really want to be paraded out here in front of all these drunk idiots? I mean, no, of course not. I don't know all the reasons why she said no, but she does what queens normally don't do. In fact, she does what normally no one does when they're summoned by the king. She says, I am not doing that, you crazy joker. You guys are all drunk. I'm not coming out there. I'm not doing it. So she says no. Well, you can imagine. This is a king, King Xerxes, who never gets told no. He is the king, and he's not elected, okay? Kings uh, rule from power and authority. Kings rule because they've conquered people, and people that are in their family get to rule. This isn't a, a, a democracy. So when he asks and he requests for Queen Vashti's appearance, like it was, she, she had to come, and she was obligated to come. And he gets mad. And of course, he's drunk and he's mad. And he, he looks around, at, I guess, at some of the, the interpreters of the law, some of the lawyers, and says, okay, guys, what, what do we got to do here? I mean, can we do something? Surely she's broken a law. I mean, she's supposed to come out. I'm the king. You can't say no to the king. So what are we going to do? And, and one of the advisors speaks up and says, yeah, king, this is a big problem. <laughs> and this is kind of funny, but this is exactly the thing that you would imagine a bunch of drunk dudes coming up with. They, they tell the king, they say, you know what, this is a bad thing. In, in fact, king, if you let this go, women from across the kingdom are going to be disobeying their husbands. This is going to set a bad precedent. I mean, you're going to have some noble that's with his wife, and he's going to tell her to do something, and she's going to say, no, remember Queen Vashti didn't come out, and I ain't going to cook your supper either. <laughs> he said, so this is going to create a bad precedent so we need to lay the hammer down now. We need, to, we need to get her out of here. You need a new queen because if we don't fix this, women everywhere are going to want to speak up for themselves. Now, this is just stupid, right? This is crazy. This is exactly the thing that you would imagine a bunch of drunk guys coming up together like, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. But that's exactly what happened because he wasn't making the best decisions. King Zerkti throws Vashti out of the kingdom and, and it's a decree like you're 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 out you're gone and he goes and later wants to choose 
another queen. Now, there's probably, in, in history, there's probably some time that passes between the time where Queen Vashti is thrown out of the kingdom and then the king searches for a new queen. In fact, there's probably a war that goes on between here, but eventually the king decides, okay, you know, I would like to have somebody around, so let, let's get the new queen set up. So he makes this kind of thing. All right, let's go out and get some candidates. Uh, you know, he sends one of his advisors out, and he says, listen, I want you to round up a bunch of beautiful women, and, and you know, you take care of them, you make them a part of my harem, and, and eventually I'm going to pick a new queen. So that's exactly what they do. Now, in this whole citadel, Citadel Susa, uh, there's a guy named Mordecai, and he has a member of his family, a beautiful girl named Esther. Okay, but now here's the thing about Mordecai. Mordecai is a Jew. He was actually uh, a part of the ancestry of the Jewish people that at one time were conquered and dragged off to different places away from their homeland. And somehow Mordecai continues to, to make a life for himself. And Esther's parents pass away, and so Mordecai kind of adopts Esther and raises her and takes care of her. And wouldn't you know it, Esther gets chosen to be candidate to be the new queen with King Xerxes. And Mordecai tells Esther, like, listen, Esther, don't tell king, don't tell anybody in the kingdom who your ancestors are in the part of the lineage. Don't tell them your nationality, okay? I mean, you're beautiful, and, and who knows? I mean, now, now, this might seem like a good thing, and, and in a sense, it is good, right? She's going to, if she goes into the Hiram, she's probably going to get taken care of in some way, you know? But, but, I mean, think about this, too. I mean, this is going to be a serious life change for her. I mean, she's, she's going to be ripped out from, from her close family. Who knows what's going to happen to her when she becomes a part? I mean, again, people do not say no to the king. This is not, you know, a godly kingdom that she's going to get a part of. I mean, you know, who knows what will happen to her? But, you know, at least Mordecai, because of his, his position, will get to keep an eye on her. And as Esther gets recruited to become a candidate for the next queen with, with King Xerxes, Mordecai does get, because he's kind of close to the situation, he does keep to get, you know, keep an eye on her. And, and scripture says that, that he, he checks up on her to, to see how things are going. Now, you know, some of you ladies, you might like to have a spa day, but what happened for Esther and these uh, queen candidates was pretty incredible. In fact, before they would go see the king, they were given special beauty treatments for an entire year. I mean, can you imagine 365 days of spa days before you go and see the king? This was how intense it was back then. There were six months of one treatment, and then they got six months of another treatment, and then they had the opportunity to see the king. And, and what would happen is they would go in, spend the night with the king, and then, you know, if it was all over, I guess they would just kind of go back into another part of the kingdom where the concubines were kind of kept and... You know, that, that was just how it went. Well, this time when Esther went into the, with the king, the king had favor on Esther and said, yeah, I like that girl. I, that, that's who it is. So, so Esther, believe it or not, I mean, this is kind of like your rags to riches story. Uh, you know, she starts as a conquered Jewish people. Her parents have passed away. Um, she gets adopted or taken care of by Mordecai. Now, all of a sudden, um, she's got this year-long beautiful treatment and spa treatment, and now she's married uh, and actually becomes the queen with King Xerxes. What an insane kind of story, but there she is. But then there's something that happens in the story that, that really begins to, to, to do the nature of the book or the purpose of the book. So at the same kind of time or, or around the same time or after, after Esther becomes the queen, there's another guy that King Xerxes elevates, and, and his name is, is Haman. It's a noble that, that uh, King Xerxes apparently has favor for, so it raises him up, and then people begin to bow down to Haman as an elevated noble in the kingdom, except one guy, Mordecai. 
Mordecai decides, listen, Xerxes, I don't know what you're thinking about this guy Haman. Now, we don't know exactly why he wouldn't bow down, other than maybe he just felt like a religious thing. I'm not going to bow down. But, but it could be that the ancestors of Haman um, threatened the Jews at some point, and maybe there was just some bad blood there. Either way, Mordecai says, I'm not bowing down to this guy. I don't care what title you give him, what position you give him. I'm not doing it. And you can imagine, again, this enrages Haman. And once Haman finds out that Mordecai is a Jew, he really kind of does the unthinkable. Instead of just eliminating or expelling Mordecai from the kingdom, he says, oh, wait, 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 Mordecai is a Jew. I'm not just going to wipe out Mordecai for his disrespect. I'm going to create a genocide and wipe out all his people in this kingdom. And so he convinces the king, hey, hey, uh, these Jewish people that are living here, they're not really on your side. They're not really helpful to the kingdom. They don't really pay attention to our laws. So, hey, let, let's just go ahead and annihilate them right now. Let's just wipe them off so you don't ever have to worry. And matter of fact, once we do this, I, if you let me do this, I'll make a good donation to the treasury of your kingdom. So King Xerxes sends out this order that all these Jews are just going to get slaughtered on a specific day. And as you can imagine, when Mordecai hears about this, he is just beside himself. He is devastated. Just because one man wasn't going to bow down to this guy, this crazy lunatic now wants to wipe all the Jews out from the kingdom. It's crazy. Now, Esther and Mordecai, they don't necessarily talk to one another on a face-to-face -face basis anymore. I mean, after all, she is the queen, and although he kind of serves in a position... The people around Mordecai that are maybe even connected to Esther kind of notice that he's upset. And Esther sends word, sends one of her servants, go out, check up on Mordecai, ask him why he's so upset. What, what's going on? Why is, why is he so devastated? And Mordecai sends back and, and tells Esther, Esther, uh, they're going to wipe out all of us. They're going to wipe out our entire people. I need you to go to the king and plead for mercy. Now, this might seem kind of like a connected request, you know, just, Esther, you're the queen, just tell the king what's going on, and ask that he doesn't do it. I mean, you're the queen. If he doesn't listen to anyone else in the kingdom, surely he'll listen to you. But Esther knows that there's something that's kind of a fine print that, you know, he, she needs to make sure that everybody knows. So she sends word back to Mordecai and says, uh, Mordecai, you do realize that when it comes to speaking to the king in his court, in front of people or in front of his presence, there's really only one rule. You don't go in unannounced or unrequested. You don't just walk into the courts of the king. That's not how it works. You don't just go into the Oval Office of the President with no security checks, no big deal, no matter who you are. Now, probably the first lady gets that opportunity, but in those days, Esther's trying to communicate to Mordecai, Mordecai, if I go in there and he hasn't asked for me and I show up unannounced, and if he doesn't give me a show, a display, if he doesn't give me his scepter, I'm dead. Like, this is incredible disrespect. Mordecai... He, she doesn't say this, but I mean, think about the events that just happened a few years earlier. Mordecai, do you realize that King Xerxes already threw out a queen because she broke a rule? I mean, she didn't come when she was summoned, and now he kicked her out, and I'm the replacement. What do you think he's going to do to me if I show up and unannounced? And oh, by the way, Mordecai, it's been like a month since he's even asked for me. Maybe, maybe, you know, he, he doesn't really want me in his presence. Maybe he's gotten over me. Maybe he's moved on. And all of a sudden, you just want me to come in there and say my piece when it could mean my life? And then Mordecai responds back to Esther. And that's the passage that we're going to read this morning. This is in Esther chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. 
When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think, Esther, that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. Don't think that just because you're the queen, it's going to be okay for you. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. God's going to take care of us some way, somehow. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time of, as this. If you've been around church, maybe you've heard that, that line. That line is like the key line from the book of Esther, for such a time as this. So he tells Esther, listen, Esther, I understand it's risky. You could lose your life, but if you don't do it, all of us are going to lose our life. And matter of fact, even though the deliverance of God may come or will come to us, then you might perish, even though you're the queen, if you don't step up. And Esther, just remember that maybe God arranged this whole thing for you to step forward in this moment for such a time as this. So Esther, Esther makes a brave decision. She says to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night and day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions, which you can imagine just the drama of this. <laughs> Esther is like, listen, just <laughs> I just need y'all to pray. I need y'all to pray. I need y'all to fast. I'm going to do this thing, but, you know, I might not be able to help y'all. And then it might end up with my life being lost as well. But in the next chapter, Esther 5, verse 1, on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> the king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. And when he saw Esther standing in the court, ooh, here's the moment. She's broken the law. She came in uninvited. She was not requested. What is he going to do? The scripture says this. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. <laughs> this, is, this is not like, you know, okay, no big deal. Like this is, you're going to live today. <laughs> I mean, this is how dramatic this moment is. She's walking up. She doesn't know what he's thinking. She says, this could be the last time I see anybody. And at that moment where she needs his help, he reaches out the scepter and says, it's okay, you're authorized to live in my presence. Now, the king says this, what is it, Queen Esther? What's your request? Even up to half of the kingdom, it will be given you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet that I have prepared for him. So an amazing turn of events that the king actually says, okay, Esther, uh, you know, you're here. It must be important. So what do you want me to do? In fact, I'm willing to do a lot. And Esther says, okay, let's have a banquet. And oh, by the way, I want you to include Haman. Now, I'm not going to, you know, read the rest of the story. Uh, eventually, what happens is they have a banquet. And it's in that banquet that Esther reveals that Haman has this plot to kill all the Jews. And instead of Mordecai dying and the rest of the Jews uh, in the story, it actually gets turned back on Haman and his family, and uh, it, it doesn't end well for Haman. And through Esther's step of courage, through stepping out in courage, she saves her people for such a time as this. Now, at, at, as we've kind of looked over this story, or you, you, you've heard this story, now I kind of want to break it down and make about three observations that I think we can learn from the story of Esther. Here's the first thing, okay? I think this story teaches us 
that you and I are blessed to be a blessing. You know, there's a reason why we were born in America. You know, there's a reason why you have had the opportunities that you've had. You know, there's a reason why you have what's in your bank account now. You know, there's a reason why you have the talents, gifts, skills, abilities that you have now. Do you know there's a reason why you are intelligent as you are? You know, there's a reason why you're natural at certain things. You know, there's a reason why you know someone who knows someone. You know, there's a reason for all of the blessings in your life. I can't tell you all of them, but I can tell you one of them. You were blessed. I was blessed to be a blessing. You know, it could have been easy for Esther to just say, look, look, Mordecai, I know you're worried, but look, I finally got mine. I finally got to the place where I need to be. I mean, I was a nobody. My parents uh, died and passed away, and, and you, took, you took me in. Thanks for that. But hey, I'm leaving that life behind. I'm the queen of the kingdom. I don't need to be worried with this stuff. It, it ends with me. If Esther had done that, what a, what a tragic way this story would have turned out. And what you and I have in common with Esther is not that you and I would necessarily rise to the ranks uh, to, to be in office and be president or vice president of the United States. But you and I do have in common with Esther is we have all, Esther, we have all been blessed. We have all been given things that we did not deserve. God has elevated us and given us influence with other people that he hasn't given everybody. He gave you special gifts. God has given everybody special gifts. And it's so important, it's so key for us to understand that we have been blessed to be a blessing. God doesn't just give stuff to people for them to accumulate, 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 and be great and famous and go, well, thank you very much, God. I'll, I'll see you on the other side. No, God gives to people because he loves to give through people. God has given things to you because he wants to do things through you. And can I say, tell you this? You haven't lived. I don't think you've really lived until you have allowed the blessing that God has given you to share with other people. You know, I, I think God's given me talents and gifts and, and things. And I, I'm not saying that to build myself up, but I'm just saying I, I think just like you, he's, he's given me gifts. And, you know, there's been a change of perspective. You know, initially when I was singing or I would do ministry or I would do these things, I, I wanted and longed for the applause of other people. I wanted fame. I want people to, to know me or to, to like me. But now I realize that God has given me the gifts. He's given me the talent and the opportunities, not just to bless me, but that through me, I can be a blessing to other people. Oftentimes I'm asked to sing at a funeral of someone that's passed away. And the older I get, the more, the more that I feel like that is, that is such a high honor. I mean, in a funeral, we're, we're considering the life of a person. This may be the last things that are said in a public gathering, maybe, I don't know, of their life. And I mean, this is, this is, this is such a, a special moment. And instead of me saying, hey, I've been given this gift to, to show off. I think God says in that moment, Jordan, I've given you this opportunity. So that hurting family that's over there, you can offer them comfort. You can sing a song that words will comfort and my Holy Spirit can work through and heal. You have been blessed with a gift so that you can be a blessing to other people. And the same is true about you all. I, I can't tell you every single gift that you all, you all have been given, but I know you've been given something. And God doesn't want it to stop with you. God wants to use those talents, gifts, and abilities, those skills to bless other people. Can I tell you something else? It's not even just the good stuff. It's the hard things you've been through, too. You might feel like, well, Jordan, I don't have a lot to offer. I don't know a lot of talents. I'll, the only thing I have is a lot of broken dreams and broken memories. I've been divorced. I've lost children. I've lost other family members. 
when I think about my life, I think that I don't really have that much to offer or I think about what I don't have. And I focus on that. Can I tell you something? God is going to use your hurts, your struggles, your pain to bless someone else if you'll allow yourself to be a vessel. Can, can I tell you something about us? We, we were blessed with Kennedy. It hurts that we don't have her here today to celebrate our birthday. But she was a blessing. And I believe that she was given to us not just so that she would bless us, but that through us and through her life, she would bless other people. Kayla did this picture thing where she took an index card and wrote some things about Kennedy and people took that picture and photos were taken from around the world. People who don't even know us know of Kennedy, at least from an index card. Her life continues to shine. And for us, even though we don't have the blessing of have, having her here, we do have the blessing of understanding other families who have lost children. We do understand what that's like. We can offer some sort of comfort. And it's really not about us. It's about what God has given us. And maybe we don't right now have that much to offer. Maybe we just understand. And maybe that's what God wants, at least for this moment. You have been blessed to be a blessing. Here's the second thing. Remember, don't forget, remember your history. That's what Esther teaches us. See, Esther could have, could have been like, well, you know, hey, I'm the queen. Forget y'all. I mean, you know, y'all smell bad. I've been taking a year of spa treatments. You know, I'm, I'm beautiful. I'm amazing. There's something unique about me. She could, she could have done that, but she also could have erased the history. She could erase the Jewish history from her vernacular. Do you, do you remember, and if you're, you're a Christian, you grew up in church, you probably remember the story of Joseph. Joseph could have done the same thing. If you know the story of Joseph, he gets sold into slavery, but through God's help, eventually makes it like the prime minister of Egypt. I mean, he is like the vice president of Egypt. And at that point in Joseph's life, Joseph, like Esther, could have just totally forgot the history, totally forgot the past, where they came from, what they went through, and said, look, I'm starting a new life. Forget y'all, forget the customs, forget the language. Forget the hopes, the dreams, forget the history. I'm done. I'm starting a new life. But Esther doesn't do that. Mordecai tells her not to do that. Mordecai says, look, you're one of us, really. I need you to plead. Don't think that you're going to escape. Esther, you might be the queen, but before you were queen, you were a part of God's Jewish nation. You're a part of this. And maybe God has put you in this position to save us. Maybe what is a new story for you is actually a part of an old story that God has been writing for many, many years, long before we got. And this is your part in the story, Esther. This is your role. And, you know, we have a saying, don't we? We, we say, never forget where you came from. Don't get too big for your britches, right? And why do we say that? Because... We're all afraid that somebody we know will get famous and move to New York City or Los Angeles and, and they'll be too good for us because here we are, you know, left behind in, in, in an area. Not many people know us and where we're from and this and that. And we, we, do, we tell people, hey, never forget where you came from. Wherever you go, never forget where you came from. Well, God would tell us the same thing. God would say, listen, you're a part of the world. You're not the center of the world. You're a part of the story. You're not the main point of the story. The main point of the story is my glory and Jesus being proclaimed throughout eternity. And you are a part of that. But understand, you're blessed to be a blessing and you're a part of a story that's bigger than you. And do not forget. He would tell that to the Israelite nation when they left Egypt. Don't forget you were slaves and I brought you here. Esther, don't forget you didn't have a mom or a dad and you got adopted. You probably maybe didn't have that much nice stuff growing up, but now you're a queen. And that's all because, not just because you're good looking, but because of what God has been doing through his redemptive story of the nation of Israel. Here, here's, the, here's the last thing, right? So listen, your best to be a blessing don't forget where you came from. Remember your history. 
And number three, courageously step into the moment. Courageously step into the moment. That, that's really the defining moment in Esther's life is when she decides to risk her own life. I mean, honestly, she could have kept it quiet. No one knew that she was a Jew. She could have kept it quiet and all those Jews would have perished and she'd be like, hey, there's no one to even point out my ethnicity now, my nationality now. There's no one left to expose me. I am who I am, and now I'm a queen, and I just, I just live the new story. But she takes a courageous moment. She risks her own life, and she steps into the moment. And I say moment because of that famous line out of this whole book. It, let me repeat it to you again. This is what Mordecai says. Who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Esther, this isn't just minutes on, an, on a time clock or on a watch. This is a moment. This is a special God-ordained moment, perhaps, for you to step into. The ancient Greeks had two words for time, chronos and kairos. Chronos is where we get chronology. It's where we, we say things are in chronological order. But there's another way to think about time. Chronos, chronology, is measured in minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years. Kairos is a special moment. Life, as Mark Batterson says, life is measured in minutes. Time is measured in minutes. But life and time is also measured in moments. See, when I got married, and when we had our first child, matter of fact, when we had our second child, that wasn't just chronology. That wasn't just, you know, minutes and the hours on a particular day. That was one of those days where there was a moment where time just stood still. <laughs> I mean, I don't know the exact minute right now as I'm preaching this. I don't know the exact minute that they were born. I can't tell you the exact minute that Kayla committed and pledged to be uh, my wife. I can't tell you the exact minute that Jonah was born. Uh, I'm sure we can find all that on birth certificates and this and that. But I can tell you those are moments that I will never forget. And, and, and here, here's the thing that I would encourage you, and I think it comes out of the, the life of Esther. Yes, you're going to be living your life in minutes, but pay attention and be aware and be prayerful that you're going to have the courage to step into a God-ordained moment. See, I think we get so caught up in busyness and minutes, we forget moments. We get, so, we get so into the routine and, and one thing after the other and yesterday is a lot like today and will probably be like tomorrow. We get so caught up into our plans and the way life is working out that we forget that all along the way there are God-ordained moments that are different than minutes. These moments are time pieces where God steps in and says, look, I want to do something special. I want to I want to save you from your sin. That's a moment, not a minute. It happens in chronology, but the moment can change your life. Maybe it's a a moment where you have had a big day where you got married or you had your first child or you moved into your first home. Or maybe it was the moments along the way, times when your kids took those first steps or said those first words times when you you got through a specific thing because it's not just good moments sometimes sometimes the the most impactful defining moments in our lives happen in difficult times happen when our world is falling apart and God steps in in that moment what my encouragement to you is have the courage to step into that to be present don't just live your life in minutes Ask God to help you capture the moments. And here's, here's what that looks like. Tomorrow when you wake up, Lord willing, you're going to have more minutes. But what I want you to pray when you wake up and you have the minutes, thank God for the minutes, but maybe ask God, Lord, 
Help me be sensitive to the moments today. Help me be sensitive to the time where time may stand still and you want to move and you want to do something that could change my life or change someone else's life forever. The scripture is filled with not just minutes. It's filled with moments. And if Esther had just been trying to live her life by a calendar and, you know, going through the minutes, maybe she would have not really appreciated what was happening. Mordecai was like, listen, Esther, this is a moment here. And think about it. If Esther had not made her decision, who knows if she even makes it in the Bible. But because she chose to step into the king's court uninvited, she captured the moment that God had written into her life. Now Esther is written into the story of the Bible. And you and I don't know what's at stake when we capture the moments in our life. You might even have a moment leaving here. You go out to eat somewhere. And somebody passes you by. And there's a moment where the Holy Spirit prompts you to do something. I want you to say hey to them. I want you to pay for their meal. And you're like, what? <laughs> God's saying, listen, this could be a moment here. Don't worry about the minutes. This could be a moment. Something's taking longer than it is. Maybe, maybe you live here tomorrow and you're, you, you know, you're trying to run an errand and it just seems to take forever. Don't you hate that? You know, you, you go to some place, you, you think it's going to take five minutes and 20 minutes later you still haven't even checked out. And you're running life by minutes and God is trying to break into your life with moments. And say, hey, there's a reason why I slowed you down. There's a reason why I made you take a detour. There's a reason why I had tra traffic bumper to bumper on 81 as you were heading into work. There's a reason, and it ain't about minutes, it's about a moment. And if you would be sensitive to the moment, maybe you would notice something that I'm trying to do in your life that you would not have seen otherwise. And maybe you were on 81 in bumper to bumper traffic for such a time as this. So it sounds crazy, but it wasn't for Esther. Who knows, it might not be for you. All right, let's close in prayer this morning. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Let me say a quick word of prayer over you. And if you're watching or you're on, you know, here in person and you're not, you're not saved, you're not a part of the family of God, I just, I just want you to take this moment because today is the day of salvation and, and it's really not about minutes, it's about moments. And maybe this could be a moment for you. And I want to pray that you do have a moment right now. And, but for the rest of us, again, we can pray about anything, but I, I would pray that we learn the stories from Esther. We learn that whatever we've been given, it's to be given through us, not just to us. That we have a history, life is connected, and God is telling a story that's bigger than us. And within that story, he has given us defining moments that I hope we don't just rush by moments that we capture. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, if there's anyone watching or participating this morning that's not saved, that's not a Christian, I pray, Lord, that you would save them as they ask for forgiveness of sin based on what you did in the cross and the resurrection. For the rest of us here, Lord, we have so many needs. We pray for Marley right now for her healing and also all the other needs. Uh, comfort, Lord, for the Jenkins family. And as we lift up those other needs, Lord, we just pray that we would learn the stories and the lessons from Esther. Learning, God, that you put her in that position for a special time. In the midst of this order that was genocide, could have been for the Jewish people. You put a woman in place to make a courageous stance in a defining moment to save the nation. And Lord, you, you, you're, you've done things for us. We're not queens of nations right now, at least that maybe that I don't know. Maybe you do have a queen that's watching this on Facebook. I don't know. But Lord, we may not have the specific position that Esther did, but we all have been given something that you want to use for your glory. And I pray, Lord, that we would have the courage to step into whatever you've called us to do and to do whatever you've called us to do. So at the end of the day, you can be glorified and we can take our place into the grand redemptive story that you are telling in the universe. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen.